So for our uh, final talk of this morning's session, um, we're lucky to have a, a crosstown colleague, uh, one of the premier tissue engineers of his generation, Dave Mooney. Um, uh, he studies how information is presented by materials to uh, tissues and cells. Um, he's a, a member of the National Academy of Engineers and is also a faculty member in the Wies Institute at Harvard. So thank you. It's a real pleasure to be here today. I've really enjoyed the symposium this morning. And before I get started, I just want to acknowledge that the work that I'll be describing today has been funded by a variety of sources and has been in very close collaboration with Glenn Drainoff, in particular at the Dana-Farber. Now, one of the interests that we've recently developed in my laboratory is in the area of cancer vaccination, and in particular, the concept of using dendritic cell vaccination. And as Dr. Irvine pointed out this morning, there's actually been significant success clinically with this approach. And Provenge was approved about a year and a half ago. And the concept of Provenge is to take cells from a patient, to manipulate those cells outside the body, and return them back to the patient with the goal that a sufficient number of those cells will be able to traffic to the lymph nodes to generate a potent T cell response. Now that approach has shown success. Uh, however, the success has been somewhat limited. There's about a four month extension of life in prostate cancer. Clearly it would be preferable if that were even greater. And there's quite a significant cost and complexity to this approach of doing ex vivo cell manipulation. And we began to think about this a few years ago. And actually, as Dr. June pointed out earlier today, there's actually a lot of complexity and a lot of questions and challenges related to scaling up this idea of ex vivo cell therapies, where we would have to try to uh, create a product that would be specific for each patient. And instead of trying to address some of the engineering challenges inherent to this, which I probably would do if I was a better chemical engineer, I instead decided that perhaps we should try to think of some way of avoiding some of these issues and problems. And in particular, what I'd like to talk to you about today is our work to try to eliminate ex vivo cell manipulation by instead moving all the biology that would normally be done in that laboratory, move it into the body, and have small pieces of plastic do all the relevant biology in situ. So that's what I'm going to describe today is our efforts to try to uh, investigate this possibility to date. Now, what this little piece of plastic is supposed to do is shown schematically on this slide. So the piece of plastic would be this blue region within the dotted lines. And the premise here is that the cells we want to manipulate already exist in the body. So we might as well try to manipulate them in situ. Now, we need to bring them into an environment that we can provide the right signals. So the first thing the material does is it releases what I'm generically calling recruiting factors. For example, chemokines or cytokines that will then be released from the material, diffuse away, bind to the target population, for example, dendritic cells or progenitor cells, and induce those cells to crawl into the device. Once they're inside the device, we now have a microenvironment that we can control and that we can potentially control the activation state of those cells as we load them with antigen. So we include what I'm generically calling programming factors here that induce activation of these cells, and then eventually we'd like to induce those cells to leave go to the target site, in this case, the lymph node, where they could interact with naive T cells. And so the next few minutes, what I'm going to describe to you is how we've tried to accomplish this. And then I'll spend some time describing the mechanism of action as we understand it to date, and then kind of a, a next generation approach to this general concept. So to start with, there we go. So the material system we're using is actually purposely very simple. We wanted something that would be as vanilla and bland as possible. So we start with a polymer, the polylactic glycolic acid, that's the same polymer that's used to make biodegradable sutures. So it has a long track record of use in humans. Uh, we developed a technique that I'm not going to go into uh, any explanation of a number of years ago when we were doing a lot of local gene therapy that allows us to take this polymer and form it into highly porous materials in which we can load bioactives. In this particular case, we're loading a particular molecule called GMCSF that's known to be a potent recruiter of dendritic cells. And we can load it in such a way that we have a sustained and localized release over about one month time period of this molecule from these polymers. And this is what these polymers look like under SEM photomicrograph. It's about the size of a small aspirin tablet. Uh, but unlike an aspirin tablet, this is something that actually gets placed under the skin instead of taken orally. And as you can appreciate, it's filled with holes. We want it to be highly porous so many cells could crawl in and live in it for some period of time. 
Now, if we take these devices and load uh, GMCS up in one and put it on the right side of a mouse, and we place another, you can appreciate that little bump that doesn't have GMCSF. What we can see qualitatively here in this transgenic mouse model is that this, the device that released the GMCSF generates this hot spot, which means we're recruiting a lot of dendritic cells to that site. Now, we can remove these devices very readily and interrogate them to see what type of uh, cells and environment we have there. And when we do that, we find that not only do we induce the ingrowth of many dendritic cells, but when we do some fact staining for those cells that are in the device, we see that we get a real enrichment for the target cell, in this case, the dendritic cell, as compared to other cell types that might be in that microenvironment. And we can control the dose of the, or simply by controlling the dose of the active, in this case, the GMCSF, we can control basically what number of dendritic cells we bring into the device. So we can bring them where we'd like them to be. Now, to try to activate those cells effectively, uh, we incorporate danger signals, um, and we take advantage of all this known now about the toll-like receptor signaling. And in particular, in the first few slides I'll show you, we focused on small oligonucleotides uh, that are rich in CPG sequences. And the general idea that we had was we have this material system. It would release a chemotactic factor that would bring in the dendritic cells. And then once they were living inside the device, they would get exposed to a high concentration of these danger signals for some extended period of time. And how we pursued this was to take synthetic oligonucleotides and we condensed them with polycations, such as polyethylene amine that's shown here, to make small polycations. And this is a technology that's very well developed in the plasma DNA uh, delivery field. And one creates small nanoparticles, such as you can see here in TEM, about 40 nanometers in size. Now, these nanoparticles are more readily taken up by cells than the free oligos, as you can see from this in vitro data, where we have a fluorescently tagged CPG. And you can appreciate here that the cells take up much more of it when it's in the condensed format than when it's in the free format. So that's one of the advantages of condensing it. But the other really crucial one here is that once we've condensed it and made these nanoparticles, they have a slight positive charge that allows us to bind them quite strongly to this polymer scaffold that we've created. And this enables them to stay resident at that scaffold for very extended periods of time. So here we're looking at some imaging of some mice. And actually, I'll just, and here's the graph that represents that analysis quantitatively. And what you can appreciate is this is the presentation of the CPG oligonucleotides as a function of time from the device in vivo. And these molecules have a half time of several hours if you simply inject them. But when we place them on the device, now we have a half-life of about 13 days. So we actually have multiple months of presentation of these danger signals from the device. And what this enables us to do is now when we recruit those dendritic cells, we can very efficiently activate those cells. Here we're looking at the number of uh, CD86 positive CD11C cells in, in the device at a particular time point. This is at day seven. And what you can appreciate is we normally have a very low number in the device. If we have GMCSF, we recruit a fair number of cells, but we don't activate them very well. CPG doesn't really recruit cells very much by itself. But when we have the GMCSF to recruit the cells and then the CPG to activate, we get large numbers of activated dendritic cells residing in the system. Now, not only do they reside in the system, but they can pick up antigen and they can traffic that antigen quite efficiently back to the lymph nodes. Where here we've done a simple experiment where we've used FITSI as a model antigen on the material. And then we're looking at the lymph nodes as a function of time for FITSI positive dendritic cells, which meant they once spent some time in our system. And here we can see some numbers for this. You can appreciate that with the uh, vaccine system that has both the GMCSF and the CPG, by day two, we're already getting a couple hundred thousand cells that came to our device, picked up antigen, and then made it to the lymph nodes, and we're over a million by day seven. So we can actually get a lot of antigen cell trafficking to the device and to the lymph nodes with this type of approach. Now, in terms of antigen that we're interested in using, in all of our early work, we've been focusing on using actually a tumor-specific mixture of antigens. We take a biopsy of the tumor. We then freeze dry it. And then we incorporate it into our scaffold, just like we do the CPG or the GMCSF, so we have a sustained release of this mixture of antigens. And the first studies we did were the pretty obvious ones. We did a prophylactic protection study where we vaccinated the mice. And then we came back two weeks later, 
and introduced the B16F10 melanoma cells, uh, very highly aggressive, poorly immunogenic cell model uh, for melanoma. And what we, what we found is shown here, where this is survival of the mice as a function of time. All the control mice die relatively rapidly. Uh, as a control here, we have a common cell-based therapy, in this case GVAX, that many of you are probably quite familiar with, that in this model leads to about a 50 or 60 percent elimination of the introduced uh, B16F10 cells. And what was pretty striking to us at the time was when we moved all the biology into the body and orchestrated just with this little piece of plastic, we now get about 90 percent effectiveness in this model. Now, this is drug delivery, but it's more than drug delivery. Because if we simply take these same bioactive agents, incorporate them, let's say, in little microspheres that we inject into the tissue and have these released over time, you still get, you get some benefit. You move the survival curve over a little bit, but nowhere near the effect that if you take the same agents and you put them inside the material and the cells crawl in and live inside that scaffold for some period of time. Now, we began to look at mechanistically how this is working, and not surprisingly, we have a potent T cell response. Here's just some data showing that actually at the vaccine site itself, we begin to see T cells arriving by about three to five days. Uh, they peak about 10 to 14 days, and then the numbers begin to fall. We think because the antigen is being exhausted from the vaccine site by that point in time. If we look at antigen-specific CD8 T cells, in this case the TRP2 uh, cells, we see that we generate large numbers of those cells, in this case in the spleen, that remain elevated for extended time periods with a single vaccination. So we're generating effector cell response. We also have looked a bit at the T regulatory response to determine whether or not we'd also upregulate that and perhaps uh, extinguish the efficacy of the vaccine approach. And so here we're just looking at a few metrics, and I'll point out a couple things. If we have the material that only has antigen and GMCSF, we actually get significant upregulation of cytokines like TGF-beta at the vaccine site. We get very significant expansion of T regulatory cells. But when we present the, G the CPG in this nanoparticle form from the device, we take the levels of the cytokines down to baseline levels. We really uh, mediate the T regulatory cell response. And the net result is if we look at the ratio of CD8 effector cells to the FOXP3 T regulatory cells, we actually skew that very heavily towards the effector cells. So this kind of data made us go back and do the more important study, which is a therapeutic model where we went ahead and introduced the B16F10, allowed the tumors to form for nine days, and then vaccinated the mouse. And this is uh, some tumor growth curves where you can see the exponential growth of the untreated tumor. Uh, the gray line here is GVAX, uh, so it basically moves the curves over substantially to the right. What was pretty striking to us was when we vaccinated a single time with this polymer, we actually moved the curve over here, and we vaccinate twice, we actually drop the, the growth curve down here to this lower line. And the reason we're driving this curve down is in a 50% of the mice that had these pre-established melanoma, we get complete regression, and these mice go on to live actually for several hundred days. So we're getting a complete regression, not with manipulating the cells outside the body, but just by placing this little piece of plastic that does all the biology in situ. Now, we've been very interested in whether or not this approach has the flexibility to mix and match different types of reagents and perhaps it applied in different ways. Um, so I won't describe today, but we have looked at a variety of different recruiting factors that we can put in the device to recruit different types of cells. Uh, what I will briefly mention is we've also looked to see whether it's very flexible in terms of what types of adjuvants we incorporate. So for example, we can incorporate CPG, as I've already described, poly-IC, MPLA, or other types of uh, TLR agonists. And what we're looking at here is, again, survival curves in a therapeutic model as a function of time. And what you can appreciate is the poly-IC in this model functions about as well as the CPG. And this particular MPLA gives some benefit, but not a tremendous amount. Now, all three of them are actually effective at generating antigen-specific T cells, although the number of that they generate corresponds pretty well to their efficacy in terms of survival. And they're all quite effective, not just generating these T cells, but having these T cells home to the tumor in an activated state. So here we're looking at CD8 resident tumor um, infiltrating cells that are positive for 107A or interferon gamma. And you can appreciate that we get large numbers, a large increase in these as compared to our control mice. And again, 
the efficacy of the different adjuvants correlates pretty well with what we see in terms of the efficacy in terms of tumor regression. Now, if we look not at the tumor site, but back at the vaccine site, we're beginning to try to probe and get some understanding of why this vaccine is effective. So we can formulate this vaccine in a variety of different ways, and we can make it either very ineffective or highly effective. And what that's allowing us to do now is begin to look for correlations. So here we're looking at some data where we're trying to correlate the number of CD8 positive dendritic cells at the vaccine site versus survival. And you can appreciate there's actually a pretty strong correlation here. Similarly, there's a very strong correlation with the number of plasmasoitoid dendritic cells as a function of its, the, the efficacy of the device in terms of survival. I don't show it here, but it's actually quite interesting. In terms of conventional DCs, such as the type that Provenge would be transplanting, we actually see a very little correlation, um, suggesting that increasing the numbers of those cell types doesn't actually give us any significant benefit. We've recently been going beyond looking simply at correlation and begun to try to see whether or not there's really a, a, a cause and effect here. So we've gone, for example, to the CD8 knockout mice. And what you see here is that when we go from the wild type to the control, we lose completely the efficacy of the vaccine. Uh, if we look at those mice, we see that now we have very few antigen-specific T cells, and actually the ratio of the effector cells to the regulatory cells is dramatically changed. So this data provides pretty compelling evidence that a key part of the effectiveness of this vaccine is its ability to recruit CD8-positive dendritic cells, and we suspect also the plasmasoitoid are going to be equally important in this model. Now, this data is, I think, potentially very uh, useful. As we look forward, as we heard about this morning, some of the antibody technologies or therapies that are coming online are undoubtedly going to be very important in this field. So we've recently begun to look to determine whether or not there's any synergy between the effectiveness of this vaccine and some of these antibody therapies. So we've been looking, for example, at some of the anti-CTLA-4 and anti-PD-1 antibodies in this approach. Now, if we use those alone in these mice models, uh, those antibody therapies don't have much effect uh, as consistent with past studies. However, it's quite striking. If we now combine them with the vaccine, we actually see a pretty potent effect. So here we're looking at data not where we vaccinated twice as in the earlier therapeutic data I showed you, but now just vaccinated a single time. So if we vaccinate once, we, get, we really slow tumor growth, but we don't stop it. But if we vaccinate once and combine with either the PD-1 or the anti-CTLA-4 antibody, we now get regression in a very large number or a very large percentage of those mice, suggesting that there may be some synergy between these approaches uh, to promoting tumor regression. Probably not too surprisingly, if we again look at the number of activated uh, CD8 T cells infiltrating the tumor, we see a significant increase with the vaccine by itself, as I mentioned earlier. And when we use either one of the antibodies, we get a further increase in the number of these effector cells at the, vac or, excuse me, at the tumor site. Now, one of the questions may be that you have at this point in time as well is, is this effective outside of melanoma? So we've actually been exploring the idea of including different types of tumor antigens and looking at the effectiveness of this approach for different types of cancer. Um, we've actually looked at it several different. I'll just show you one piece of data here in one particular model. But we have similar data actually in a couple models now. And this is in a model of glioblastoma. And again, a therapeutic model. So we allow the, the tumor to form. And then we vaccinate, in this case, at day seven. And what you can appreciate from the survival curve here in the lower panel is that, again, the vaccination actually has a pretty potent effect, in this case, about 90% regression of the established tumors as compared to the controls that all die uh, you know, 20 or 30 days. The other thing that this piece of data points out is that there seems to be a, a pretty potent memory response. If we take these mice and take the ones that survived and showed regression of the tumor initially, and we re-challenge them 100 days later with fresh cells to mimic recurrence, we see that about 70% of those mice, again, are able to kill off all the cells that we reintroduce, suggesting that there's a pretty potent memory response that's induced by this vaccina vaccination strategy. So we actually are moving forward actually pretty rapidly, as I mentioned at the end of the talk, in terms of looking to see whether or not this approach has utility not just in mice, but also in humans. But we're also beginning to look forward and say, well, you know, how could we make this a system perhaps better, more practical, more useful? And one of the limitations of this approach is that it's a, it's a small device, 
but it has to be implanted. It can be in an office visit, uh, the surgeon, so it doesn't need all our time, but it'd be nicer if we could have something that could simply be injected via needle and syringe. And so Eileen Lee in the laboratory has been investigating this possibility, and in particular, she's been exploring the possibility that we could create small, high aspect ratio microparticles that we could then inject more or less in a random mixture into with tissue, where then over time they would more or less collapse or self-assemble into each other to form a similar types of three-dimensional porous network as that PLG scaffold that I've been talking about until this point in time. Now the approach here is to take mesoporous silica. So this is a type of silica that's nanoporous, as you can see here in this TEM analysis. So it has pores on the nanoscale, so we can load the biologics now into these pores. And then the concept would be, we could then inject these into mice, and when we've done this, what we find is they do get, generate a small uh, pocket here. And if you do the exploitation, you see you get a, a nodule of tissue that forms. And when you look with EM, you see that you actually have a highly, highly cellular um, site that's formed. And if we digest away all the cells, you can appreciate all the microparticles that did assemble together to form this porous structure in situ to which the cells got recruited. So we've been exploring whether or not this general approach could be useful in a similar manner as the PLG vaccine in terms of whether we could use molecules like GMCSF to recruit immature dendritic cells, whether or not we could then deploy these cells back to the lymph nodes. And we've been particularly interested in looking at humoral responses with this approach. So we've begun to look at whether or not we're getting B cell priming, uh, formation of germinal, germinal centers, and ultimately whether or not we're getting an antibody response. And I think I've got a couple minutes. Okay, uh, I'll just briefly go through a little flavor for where we're going with this. So we are able to load antigen and other biomolecules very readily into this device. In this case, the data I'll show you is with a model antigen of albumin. And you can appreciate that if we simply inject this antigen into mice, very rapidly gets cleared and lost from that site. If we load it into our microparticles that we then inject and form this porous structure in situ, we get a now a very sustained presentation of antigen from that site. And if we look at the ability of the dendritic cells that are recruited to this site to pick up antigen and then go to the lymph nodes, we find that we get very large numbers now. You can appreciate this is about um, half a million cells at this particular time point that where we have cells that came to our device that released GMCSF and presented CPG, they picked up antigen, and now we can detect them in the draining lymph nodes. So we're getting large numbers of the dendritic cells coming to the device, again, picking up antigen and leaving. We also, with this system, get quite a bit of B cell trafficking to the vaccine site, where here we're looking at B220 positive cells actually in the scaffold as a function of time. And you can appreciate by five days, we're getting very substantial numbers of them at the site. We're getting very significant expansion of B cells back in the lymph node itself, is indicated by the number of B220 positive cells in the draining lymph node. And in all this, we're looking at basically the, um, the MPS, basically the scaffold by itself, the scaffold that's releasing antigen, and then the complete vaccine. And we also get formation of germinal centers, as indicated by significant expansion in the number of the B220 GL7 positive cells again, in the lymph nodes with the vaccine system. Now, one of the questions is whether or not we're getting a T cell response here. So to analyze this as an, in a preliminary manner, we've been taking the OT2 cells that have been fluorescently labeled and transplanting those into vaccinated uh, Th1.1 positive cells and looking to see whether or not, once we isolate the transplanted um, CD4 cells, whether we're getting expansion. And what you can appreciate is in naive mice, we get very little proliferation of these cells. If we have a nonsense antigen, we again get very little. But if we deliver the alvalbun, which is the antigen for these T cells that we've adaptively transferred, we get very significant proliferation, either the uh, material as a carrier for the antigen by itself or the complete vaccine system. And then finally, when we look a little more carefully at these T cells that we've transplanted, we also see that we get very significant expansion of the CD4 T uh, follicular helper cells with this vaccine approach as indicated by the fax analysis. And the net result of all this is that we can generate some pretty robust antibody responses with this very simple approach that controls the cell trafficking. So here we're looking at two specific antibodies, uh, IgG1 serum levels, 
And you can appreciate that when we use the material system to deliver the antigen, we actually generate large um, titer of this antibody. Now, that's not dependent on presenting the danger signal. We actually get it with or without the danger signal. And this is more of an indicative of a Th2 response. If we look at other antibodies, for example, IgG2A, we again can get very robust levels that form and that remain for very long periods of time. And this is dependent on also having the CPG signaling along with the vaccine. So I'm going to stop here. And hopefully what I've been able to do is give you a little flavor of how we're trying to design biomaterials to move biology that's normally done in a laboratory in vivo instead. And uh, these materials control the timing and the spatial presentation of a variety of immune modulators, as well as housing immune cells while they get exposed to these agents. Uh, we've been able to demonstrate a therapeutic effect in a couple different preclinical models. Uh, we are beginning to understand the molecular and cellular blueprint that may underlie the effectiveness of this approach. And I didn't have a chance to go into it today, but we think this may be a very broad platform, actually, for immune modulation, effective not just in cancer, potentially in infectious disease. And since we have the ability to actually tune the effector versus the T regulatory response with this approach, we think this could be very useful in things like autoimmune disease and transplant rejection as well. Now, as I mentioned, you know, we are interested in translation of this approach at the Wies Institute, which is right across the river. Uh, one of our main missions is to take things out of the laboratory and translate those into the clinic. And so we've been collaborating very closely with investigators at the Dana-Farber, including Steve Hody, who will be uh, one of the presenters this afternoon. Oh. And to take what we now call WDVAX, which is the Wies Dana-Farber vaccine. So it's a therapeutic melanoma vaccine. Uh, we filed an IND on this back in 2000, or in January, a couple months ago, and Steve Hody and Glenn Drainoff were the PIs and will run the clinical trial. Uh, the FDA approved this trial in, two, in February, and so we'll begin enrolling patients in the near future that will allow us to do the experiment that really matters that we've heard a lot about today, which is to determine whether or not this strategy is not just effective in rodent models, but actually is effective in, in humans, or effective in humans as well. So thank you.